Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda LaCastro from Stevenson University, which is in Baltimore. So that's 45 minutes or three hours away, depending on traffic. Um, more like three hours today. <laughs> Um, I want to thank Jeremy and Nate for inviting me here, um, especially because they specifically invited me because I have a new book chapter out on this exact subject, which I'll plug a little bit more at the end. But I've been thinking a, a lot about the ways that we can use social annotation not just to, to teach reading and writing, which we've talked about a lot today, but I actually teach media history. So I'm thinking about how to teach the history of the book through annotation. So I'm sure that my fellow educators in the room are getting tired of hearing things like students don't know how to write, students don't know how to read, or frankly, students don't read, students don't write or write well, right? Now we also hear students don't know how to annotate <laughs> or students don't annotate anymore. You can take this quote from William Logan as an example here. He's kind of lamenting the lost art of annotating and I frankly think that's because we are, have a narrow-minded view of what reading and writing and annotating looks like. We think of it as in print form and print-based. But scholars such as Kathy Yancey have proven time and time again that actually people are reading and writing more in this moment than ever before. And I contend they're also annotating more than ever before. Take this example. It is a screenshot from the Kindle app on my phone. And it demonstrates that 9,940 people highlighted this text. Can any of my literary folks guess what text this is from these small snippets? Oh. Yes, this is Orwell's 1984, a text which is popular, but is also capital L literature, and has had a nice resurgence since November 2016. So while well, I think some of these highlighters might be students who are assigned this text, I think it's a good example of how many, many people are annotating, right? just because they want to, because they want to engage in a shared reading experience. So I want to shift this question from do students annotate or do people annotate to what kind of annotations do we privilege, do we value, and do we want to, to be teaching our students to do? I agree with Jason Jones, who's written extensively on annotation, that the foundation of a humanities or even broader to a liberal arts education is conversation, that we want students to be engaged in dialogue and discussion around concepts, not just regurgitating and memorizing. So I'm focusing here on the social aspect of annotation and kind of historicizing the social aspects of annotation. And thank you to Gardner Campbell who already showed you a few of these texts, right? We have uh, Douglas Engelbart and uh, Van Ver Bush up here. Um, I also have the Talmud and the Early Modern Book of Hours up here because in fact these texts, are, I use them in my classroom to show that annotation has been used for social purposes, for instructive purposes, to provide directions on how to read a text, to provide definitions, to provide um, also that kind of internalized reading experience that allows people to connect across space and time, um, but also offers the ability for a networked or a connected series of texts. So I use this to model for my students the kind of long tail of social annotation. And I also use this as a foundation to prepare them to connect with the Book Traces project, which if you're unfamiliar with it, Book Traces is sponsored as a part of Nines um, out of the University of Virginia. It is, uh, uh, the project lead is Andrew Stauffer. And the idea is that they collect pre-1923, Jeff, that's your area, right? Pre-1923 texts that include marginalia. Why is this important? Because this was an era marked by cheap printing. Paper was cheap. So a lot of institutions and libraries have multiple copies of the same text. Take Frankenstein, for example. It's the 200th year anniversary of Frankenstein. Go Mary Shelley, right? But most libraries have more than one copy of Frankenstein. The problem is that when we have budgetary and space crisis, which is conflating for many of us at this moment, libraries and institutions have to make the decision about which text to destroy or move off site. If you follow anything about the New York Public Library, you're involved in this debate, right? 
So Book Traces is saying, hold on, some of these multiple copies are being earmarked for destruction, but they actually include essential marginalia that scholars can use to study the history of reading and to study the history of these texts. So obviously a small group of people can't possibly find all the instances of marginalia in all the pre-1923 texts that exist in all institutions across the world, but we can crowdsource it, <laughs> right? So they're asking institutions that have these kinds of collections in their stacks to engage their students in the work of finding, digitizing, and archiving marginalia. So I have my students do this. I've had my students do this for maybe almost 10 years now. And uh, back when I was at NYU, um, when I was a graduate teaching intern, I actually brought my students to the Butler Library at Columbia University to find these uh, dilapidated books, often falling apart. And I asked them to look at the marginalia, determine whether this marginalia was kind of from a pre-1923 reader or a modern reader, like if it's red pen, right? probably a modern reader, <laughs> right? And to kind of figure out what the marginalia was, what, what kind of message was it conveying, and determine whether or not it should be digitized and uploaded to the site. They learned a lot about information architecture here, right? They had to fill out the database, understand the database uh, uh, infrastructure. They had to understand why, right, digitizing these elements were important. But they also learned a lot about the place of a library and the importance of a library. These are information literacy skills that often students don't get otherwise. It may be a surprise to you, but students find libraries intimidating, right? And they don't have a lot of experience with old books. A lot of what my students commented on were the fact that their hands were literally dirty, right, at the end of the day, and that they had big questions about how these books were being stored, preserved, accessed, and how the humanities plays a role in that larger conversation about how we preserve and, and access um, old forms of media. Like, how do we actually preserve history, right? So you can see uh, from some of my students' comments, I had them do blog posts about their experience, that the kinds of things they found also taught them about um, the history and provenance of um, uh, library collections, so they would find dedication pages, right? They would find things that showed how we actually acquired these texts, and they came to find that the library is more than just a place to study, right? But it, it held this kind of essential role in the, the finding um, and archiving of material. So now at Stevenson University, our library does not have this kind of collection. So we use the Book Traces site itself to engage with these kinds of um, historical uh, pieces of um, archival material and marginalia. But as you can see, they still are making these great connections between the kinds of marginalia they see in these texts and things like email. Right? So my student Ryan Rochier says that the kinds of notes he found remind him of modern day email. There are notes to lovers and friends scrawled on the pages, right? That people are having conversations in these texts the same way that we use Twitter, right? To have conversations with each other. Um, he also found that it was really interesting that you could study the lives of these people, that often there was uh, generational notes in marginalia, right, where it's a mother passed a text down to a daughter who passes it down to her daughter, and they actually chart the whole history of a family in some of these texts. So then I want to move the kinds of lessons they've learned from these older forms of media into the digital space. So I give them a printed out version of a born digital text that they've never seen before. And I ask them to read it in the classroom space. I give them a short amount of time. And as they read, they have to make tally marks every time they got distracted. In about five minutes, most of them have 20 tally marks. Right? I then have them do the same activity, but this time they have to annotate as they read. At the end of the activity, I asked them a couple basic comprehension questions about the text, and all of them have marketably, marketably better comprehension and confidence about the text after doing the annotation version of the exercise than reading with the tally marks. We talk about how 
this, and this, this is the text we use, and you can see it's a very transparent meta-awareness activity because right here, one of the, the pull quotes there, is the idea that we've always been multitasking, we've always had our brains wandering, it's not the digital space that causes this. They're also wandering when they're just looking at a physical page. But that we need tools, right? We need active, engaged learning to help us channel that multitasking and that wandering into something productive that will help us learn. So I have them read Kathy David, a selection of, from Kathy Davidson's Now You See It, which explains what attention blindness is and about how 21st century readers can, active, uh, can actually use their attention blindness um, to think about what they're focusing on and what they're missing, the gorilla in the room, as the uh, cover shows, right, that they might miss um, if they don't pay attention to kind of all the different aspects at the same time. And we use that to understand how annotating can actually help us focus, but how social annotation can help us catch the gorilla in the room, right? So I have actually used several different online annotation platforms to, um, to use in the classroom. I did use Annotation Studio from MIT. I've used Google Docs, uploading the, the documents and having students engage that way. But the reason I really like Hypothesis is because it mimics some of those things we saw in the 19th century annotations, such as multimodality. In a lot of the books that you find in the Book Traces Project, you'll find things like doodles, locks of hair, pieces of clothing, flowers, <laughs> right? Uh, connections to other texts and other readers that are very interesting and multimodal at their nature. Read Jody Shipka, she talks all about this. Um, the other thing I like is, of course, the fact that you can make it public, which some uh, annotation studios public within a class, but not public at large. And Google Docs, of course, has that multi-layer of allowing people or not in. Um, this particular example that you're looking at is from a 100 level class, not from my media history class. And the reason why I bring this up is because in a 100 level class, I actually do keep it to a private group. I require them to do about 10 to 12 annotations and four to five replies. And I give them kind of a list of good annotation practices, right? So we talk about definitions. We talk about references, looking up references. We talk about questions and conversation starters. I call them provocations, right? And we talk about using tags and, and other things. This closed group kind of gives them the uh, ability to practice at the 100 level, uh, you know, the introductory level class that they can then move to prime time in the upper level classes and go public. If you look at the student writing in the side here, um, what, I, what I really like is that the students are kind of answering each other and having an interesting conversation here with each other. Um, I really like to use this as an opportunity to talk about being a good digital citizen and practicing good, um, responsible, respectful commenting practices that hopefully will transfer to their lives outside of the classroom, perhaps to Reddit <clears throat> or YouTube, um, <laughs> when they think about commenting and having a conversation with people in a digital space. I have encountered some bad practices, such as a student hitting on another student. He actually wrote, add me on Snapchat, and she wrote back, nah. <laughs> <laughs> right? And then I brought that into the classroom and we talked about why that was an inappropriate use of the space. <laughs> right? And it gave me the opportunity to have those conversations. Having the conversations that come from the annotations in the physical face-to-face -face classroom is one of my favorite things about doing this, this, these exercises. Not only can I have the, that's maybe not the best use of the software conversations, but I can also t take some of these really big important conversations and give them a larger space and time. So here you have one of my students talking about how he would love to do this in all of his classes for all of his work. And another student saying, but what about all of the bad things that could happen in a public space? So we were able to, to expand that discussion. This is from one of my upper level classes, the book history class I previously mentioned. And for these public facing engagements, I always choose platforms that I know encourage this kind of engagement. 
And I usually pick articles that I know have other public um, annotations on them. So I knew this article already contained annotations from other people around the world so that my students would be forced to engage with people outside of the class in order to uh, complete the assignment. If you look at my uh, students' conversation here, you'll notice that they're picking up on really nuanced language choices in the article, and that they're actually connecting the work of my class to other classes they've taken at the university, which is like a gold mine for us professors, right? We want them to say, hey, my critical theory class talked about reader response, and I see reader response at work in my book history class. Yay, right? <laughs> it's exactly what we want our students to be doing, and they're demonstrating that work here, and I had nothing to do with it, right, creating that conversation. I also use this for rhetorical analysis. So I have my, um, my students choose an article from a preset list uh, of publications, and they use it to identify author, audience, um, purpose, so on and so forth. But I also specifically ask them to do a visual rhetorical analysis on the digital elements of the text. So they have to comment on the image, the font choices, the color choices, and the layout choices of the digital text, which is another reason I like Hypothesis more than an annotation studio or a Google uh, Docs, because those erase those digital elements that, you, that I actually want my students to be very directly engaged with. We do a whole unit on fonts, so I want them to think about the font choices at work in the articles that they're looking at. Um, this particular example, my student at the top you can see, is actually connecting the hyperlinks used by hy hybrid pedagogy to the concept of hyperlinks Joanna Drucker talks about in another text we read in the class. <laughs> right? <laughs> so she's, she's applying the co conceptual framework of one book that we read to the practical usage of it by the journal. So there's actually been a lot of studies on this, and I could get in big trouble for this because Blackboard is mandatory at my university. Every single professor, no matter what you're teaching, has to use it. But <laughs> there have been studies done. Uh, the one I'm, I'm particularly thinking of is by Vanderpool, Admiral, um, and I should look up the other name. Um, th that actually shows that the kinds of conversations that happen on hypothesis are more grounded in the text, um, sustain conversations about one particular point longer, and are um, in involve more voices often than the Blackboard discussion boards about the same topic, right? Um, so let's see if I can look up that. Anyway, I, uh, the slides are tweeted if I, if I can't find the names. Um, there's also a... Um, wonderful study by Faye Gao that looks at 122 comments um, uh, collected that demonstrate that the um, motivation of students writing with hypothesis versus the Blackboard discussion posts um, are incre uh, increase, right, that they write more, that they tend to write more than is required by the instructor versus the, the Blackboard posts. I don't think I'd be a good humanist if I didn't also critique the tool. So as many of you know, um, Hypothesis was a kind of an outcropping, a, a variation of genius. Um, my students are very familiar with genius or rap genius. Um, they may not be familiar with annotating a E.M. Forster short story, but they do like to comment on who Becky with the good hair is, <laughs> right? So they know this, they, they recognize this, and they use those tools and they can transfer them to um, the annotation assignments I'm asking them to do. But I do like to talk to them about some of the issues there at work there. So Genius was criticized by the blogging community for um, basically allowing the site to graffiti works without the author's permission. Um, all annotation tools do this, right? We don't ask permission to annotate. Um, but I do think that uh, Hypothesis has done a good job of allowing us to moderate comments. You can flag comments. Sites can block the hypothesis um, uh, add-on. So what I want to do is just encourage my students to think about how we are 
responding to the authors, especially those from marginalized communities with vulnerable voices. To think about the way that we're engaging with work in a way that's respectful and thoughtful and that the author themselves might read. What the a tool like Annotation Studio does is it kind of negates those arguments by keeping it in a protective space and removing it from the eyes of the author. What that prevents is conversations with the author, right, that actually have happened in my class where the authors have responded to some of my students. Um, but it does allow them a space to, to not kind of have to worry about offending anyone, which might, in some cases, when you want to talk about authors in a way that's, that's brutally honest, might be advantageous. So it's a, it's a reason to consider other tools. For the final project in my book history class, students use um, all of the tools that they've learned to actually engage in designing the future of reading devices and reading technology. So their final project is to pitch a reading device that will meet the need of an audience that's not currently being met by our reading technologies. So this is adapted from Carrie Krauss at the University of Maryland, who does design fiction with her graduate students. And my students have to put together an implementation plan, an environmental scan, um, a marketing program, uh, and extensive research about a specific population that they want to um, address and how they're going to do it through a new technology. So this one is directly inspired by Hypothesis. Um, they wrote about Hypothesis in this final paper. And you can see that they designed a physical bookmark that would allow you to annotate a physical book, but that would link you to all the digital tools so that your annotation is kind of um, moved away and allows you to focus, but still gives you those reminders, but you wanted to look up this word, or you wanted to look up this reference, or you wanted to save this note um, and connect to other things. This one was actually inspired by a student's aunt who has ALS and um, needed to use eye tracking software and dictation software to make annotations. So their idea was to allow um, eye tracking software to create the highlights and annotations and dictate what they wanted to um, annotate and wanted to communicate with others. I thought this was a really thoughtful, interesting um, project that addressed a very specific need. So this is the uh, full article that can be found in the uh, Rutledge collection. Um, I cannot distribute the full thing in for a year, but uh, you are more than welcome to contact me for a pre-publication copy to read. Um, and here's my contact information if you need it. Thank you. Hey, y'all, I know we're getting close to the end of the day, we, and we have just one more event, but uh, just because Amanda came penultimately, is that a word? Um, doesn't mean that we shouldn't ask her some questions. Does anybody have any questions for Amanda? All I know is that I definitely want one of those bookmarks. Oh my God. Are they in production yet? No? How many people here would like one of those bookmarks? Oh, wow, okay. Tell, tell that student that they got to mark it, at least in this small room. Yeah, here. I'll just call her. Oh, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. Sorry, I was thinking it'd be loud and southern. I forgot you were trying to record. Sorry, Nate. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on your list of good annotation practices and how you're presenting this to students, if it's in the context of annotation or if it's separate from and if it's different for different levels? Yes. Um, so I teach everything on WordPress. It is uh, My assignment sheet is up on WordPress. It is part of the assignment sheet where I actually list, uh, I think it's like 10 kind of ideas for your annotations. Um, it is not exhaustive. They're, of course, able to go above and beyond or outside of the, that list. But on there is the usual culprits of uh, definition, looking up references, um, asking provocations, um, uh, linking to multimedia, things like that. Um, and then, of course, in the reply, I talk about um, respectful, responsible replies and, and conversation in that, in that section. 